it's time for another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas, the podcast covering the intersection of business, culture, entrepreneurship, and life in general here in the Ozarks. Whether you are considering a move to this area or trying to learn more about the place you call home, we've got something special for you. Here's our host, Randy Wilburn. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn. I'm excited to be here today. I've got another great guest for you. And you guys know, I'm always finding guests in a variety of ways. This individual, I actually read about him and I can't remember where I saw an article, but then I also saw a post on LinkedIn that referenced his new app called Sober Sidekick and some of the things that this individual was doing in such a short period of time. And the thing that really connected me with him was the fact that he's only been here for a couple of months here in Northwest Arkansas at the time that we're recording this. And so I wanted to get him on the podcast. I wanted to hear his story because I think it's very special. And I think there's some of our listeners that could really benefit from hearing Chris's story. But Chris Thompson is the founder of Sober Sidekick, and uh, we're excited to have you on the podcast. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Ready to get into it. Okay, cool, cool. Well, listen, man, I'd love for you just to kind of share your, and as we always start this, we always want to get to know the individual that we're talking to. So if you could share your superhero origin story, you can go back as far as you want. If you want to go back to diapers, you can, but, <laughs> yeah. but if you want to kind of start where your story started based on the, sh- the story that you share on your website, that's fine too, but yeah, you, I'll let you have at it. Yeah. Well, first off, I'm someone who believes everyone in recovery is on a superhero origin story or comeback story. Yeah. And um, I also believe, you know, anyone can be in recovery from anything. You know, it's not just drugs or alcohol. But yeah, back to me, you know, I'm someone who was a college athlete. I started my first business at a young age. And, you know, especially 19, 20, 21, I I felt kind of invincible, you know. (laughs) I felt like I was first starting to believe I I could do anything I I set my mind to. And alcohol became like an added layer to the feeling that I had that I could accomplish anything. And, you know, it boosted me for a while. It was, it brought me out of my shell. It allowed me to be outgoing. I'm naturally an introverted person. It allowed me to deal with my fears, my insecurities, and gave me that pseudo confidence that I'd always wished I had. But around 21, 22, almost overnight, there was a crazy situation that I didn't know how to deal with. And uh, almost overnight, alcohol became my only solution for all my problems. And yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, because I I, I read a little bit about you in advance. And one of the things that you mentioned and I I thought about this was that you were not, it wasn't like you were that kid growing up sneaking alcohol and all that stuff. It was like one day you took a drink and it was almost like this was a long lost friend that you had, you, you, you never knew you Mm -hmm. had. Yeah. And then that's just kind of where it evolved. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times when people think about addictions or think people think about some of the vices that we struggle with, and we all struggle with different oh, yeah. vices. Yeah. Um, let's be clear about that, that it's not, it doesn't, you know, that it just sneaks up on you and happens all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. And, but I just think the way that you shared that was, was really interesting. Yeah. And I, I've heard a lot of people in recovery describe it as their first drink was the first time they felt comfortable in their own skin. Wow. Is one way I've heard it yeah. described. Yeah. I mean that, yeah. And that says a lot, right? Because it's mm-hmm. like, wow, that means you know, if you didn't get your first drink until you're like in your mid twenties, then that means that you've never felt comfortable in your own skin Mm -hmm. until that alcohol, you started consuming it. And Mm -hmm. then it it gave you almost like a new identity, if you will. Yeah. hundred percent. And that's why my recovery, I'm I'm quick to say alcohol was never my problem. It was my only solution. Yeah. Wow. So I'm curious, what kind of athlete were you in in college? Basketball. It okay. Was, it was D3. So okay. Nothing it's to all brag good. About. It's all yeah. good. Yeah. No, I mean, listen, I, I went to school on a swimming scholarship and mm. uh, I swam at Howard University. Mm. And uh, that was a, you know, for me, that was a, a big deal. I fell out of it after a couple of years just because I discovered girls <laughs> and um, just living the life in Washington, yeah. D.C. I also had a job on Capitol Hill. So 
Mm. I don't know. You know, it just it, there were a, a bunch of other influences that mm. caused me to move away from being an athlete. But just the simple fact that I was able to go to college as an athlete, I understand the rigors of that. And it's yeah. not easy. So you have to put your all into it. So mm-hmm. talk to me, because again, you share in your story that not long after you decided to become sober, well, even before that, can you mm-hmm. give us kind of an idea of where alcohol took you yeah. before you overcame it? Yeah. So it, I kept thinking for the next three years that this is my rock bottom (laughs) and it kept getting lower and lower and lower. I was, you know, isolated. I couldn't finish anything. I had a ton of great ambition, but I couldn't finish anything. And, you know, I watched myself slowly become the worst version of myself. I, I wasn't available to my family. You know, I wasn't a my relationships, I was uh, pretty much everyone in my life ever, I was selling them short. And where it got me was a place I never thought I would be considering where I was three, four years before. But Thanksgiving Day 2018, November 22nd, which is actually today, (laughs) um, I woke up on the sidewalk for about the fourth day in a row the hospital pants and, and the poncho I was wearing were literally all I had left. I had lost my phone, my wallet, trying to buy Coke, just like a ridiculous bottom. And somewhere in LA, I mean, I was very new to LA. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so in a, a city that I didn't understand, didn't know, it had rained the night before and it never rains in LA. And the whole night it was raining. I was just trying to move where like the rain wasn't constantly dripping on my forehead, like literally a bottom that I never imagined for myself. Yeah. Far away from home. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can only imagine what that's like when you hear those stories. And and I think we all love a good comeback, right? Mm-hmm. So when you were at that, we would call the nadir, right? The, the lowest point. Mm-hmm. I mean, where were you mentally as far as that was concerned? Yeah. Well, one of the reasons why it's so difficult for people to get over a substance abuse issue is because their body has become dependent on it. So for me that morning, you know, I was waking up when I woke up, my body was in the worst shape ever. You can die from, you know, alcohol withdrawals. Sure. And, you know, I, I've had these symptoms before, but I was like, somewhat disconnected from reality, you know, like I knew what was real and I knew what wasn't, but what wasn't real felt way more real, like yeah, hallucinations, delirium tremens, like, you know, completely sober, but can't walk straight, like can't put together a thought. And, you know, it's Thanksgiving day and I'm sitting outside the supermarket and I'm watching people go in and out buying groceries, pumpkin pies, all these different things. And, you know, I had tried to ask a few people if I could borrow their phone and they're like, I don't want to talk to you. Yeah. You know, and I- On I, Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I realized I had gotten to that point, you know, I had gotten to that point where I'm that guy on the side of the road that no one wants to talk to. Yeah. And, you know, there's a thought that I had heard in AA meetings before that, which, you know, people had described their rock bottom as my best thinking got me here. Mm. And, you know, that was one of my first honest thoughts of that day is my best thinking got me here, which was the humility that I didn't have up to that point, which is I don't have the answers. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know how I got here. I don't know whose fault it is. If it's my fault, if it's genetics, if it's trauma, if it's like, but it doesn't matter at this point because only I can take responsibility for my life. and. There's plenty of people who have overcome way worse situations. Yeah. And, you know, that's where the question I I started to ask in my head is, you know, what if today is my day one and one day or day one? What if today is day one? Yeah. So then based on what you just said to me, Mm -hmm. had you tried to go through AA before you hit this lowest point? Had you so you had you tried to to fix the problem? Yeah, yeah. So I had tried. I've I've been trying probably for the last nine months and I couldn't put together 30 days. The reason I was in California is I called a hotline and went to treatment for the first time. And I kind of went to treatment with the perspective that maybe they can fix me. Sure. 
And I mean, the biggest lesson for me in recovery is it's me versus me. Yeah. You know, you're, start- you're, you are your greatest competition. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there is nobody else. Yeah, and that's a blessing or a curse. Yeah. And, you know, for the last four years, it's been a blessing because if everything is someone else's fault, there's nothing I can do to make my life better. Right. But any area that I can see my role in the situation is an area that I can get better in an area that life can expand for me. And yeah, yeah, it's that victim mode that is, is so easy to fall into. And I thought I had the best victim story ever. So <laughs> you were like going to get an Academy Award for your victim story, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So then, okay. So you're in LA, you are soaked. It's Thanksgiving um, mm-hmm. 2018. Yeah. And, and at that moment, that was kind of for you, the moment where you said, all right, this something has to change. Yeah. What changed? Yeah. So I guess I imagine like, you know, it's hard putting together like the order of events or the order of thoughts, but I, I was picturing myself like 20 years from now. Yeah. And it's like, imagine if you look back 20 years from now and told a story about today was the day that you made that change and then taking a step back and then focusing on today. It's like, you know, just more focused on today and that moment than ever before. Right. Because today is the only day that matters. I mean, they're going to take action today or I won't, you know, and I just committed that, you know, recovery is going to be my number one goal. That's going to be my number one priority because all the times up until then, it was like, it was my goal, but it was kind of an ancillary goal, like to get, like, I need to figure out how to you know, stop drinking so I can go back to work yeah. or I need to figure out how to stop drinking so I can like, you know, hold a relationship or hold a friendship, right. you know? And it was always for these external things that weren't me. Yeah. You know, I need to, I need to get sober so I can stop disappointing my family, you know? Mm-hmm. And also it's that, that guilt and that shame and that stigma, which all of that, like the worst part of guilt and shame is the self-imposed part because everyone has opinions, no matter whether you're doing well or you're doing terrible, like people are going to have opinions. Yeah. So, you know, since then, you know, I feel nothing but gratitude for where I am and where I came from. But when your internal guilt and your internal shame is so strong, then anything anyone says externally only amplifies that. So, you know, the other big leap was just setting aside that guilt and shame and, you know, doing whatever I needed to do to get help, you know, going wherever I needed to go to get help and just saying I need help. And it took me like 10 hours to get to where I needed to get because the first few places didn't work out. But I finally walked into a sober living that I had gotten kicked out of like a month before and just walked in and my friend Bill and Aaron were there and I just walked in and said, I need help. And that's when, you know, all the help came my way. And then you also said somewhere that you had reached out to your mom, I guess, Mm -hmm. about helping you out. And you were like, listen, this is it. I've got to do it now or it's not going to happen. And and she was able to help you, I guess. Yeah. So that, that was the step before that. So I had gone to a, a hospital and found my way there and you know, I was trying to say whatever I needed to say to get help. And they just said, this isn't a homeless shelter, but you can use the phone. So I I called my mom and, you know, of course it's Thanksgiving. So she's stepping away from family and I'm just, I'm just feeling it, you know, from the perspective that all the families on the East coast, Mm -hmm. like I'm putting them through this, like they haven't heard from me in a week and they're trying to, my phone is gone. They're and, you know, putting them through all this. And she offered to order me an Uber from the hospital to the sober living. And I just said, like, this is the last time. And I truly felt like I meant it at the time. And now four years later, I, I believe. Yeah. You said that it was about, you were only like 60 days sober 
when I guess, and when most people would still be hyper focusing on themselves, you were thinking, man, you know, there should be something out there for other people that are going mm-hmm. through what I'm going through that can kind of help them along the way. Mm-hmm. Is that in its simplest form how Sober Sidekick was born? Yeah. Well, it was actually 30 days later okay. where I started. Oh, I, I don't want to shortchange you now. 30 days. Okay. 60 days is when it was released. Okay. I got you. I got um, you. I love that. But I mean, the simple fact is that you're, you're 30 days being mm-hmm. clean mm-hmm. and sober and already you're thinking about ways that not, not only it would benefit you, but it would ultimately help other people. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't call that selfless. In fact, I can make the case that it was selfish from the perspective that in recovery, I, I've learned that it's all about getting outside of yourself. Yeah. Like that's how you remain on track. That's how you, you know, stay grounded. That's how you, you stay in peace. And, you know, I'm not a religious person, but, you know, the third step prayer, God, who I just identify as a higher power that I will never understand. The third step prayer goes like, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me, to do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage to self so I may better do your will. Take away my difficulties so that victory over them can bear witness to your love, your power, and your way of life. And the biggest line for me, the line that I hold on to in that prayer is relieve me of the bondage to self. And I believe recovery isn't about overcoming alcohol or drugs. It's overcoming ego. Alcohol and drugs is just the fuel that makes you so attached to your ego and so so much in self-preservation mode. Sure. Fear-driven. And fear only comes from ego. You know, it's about protecting a conception of yourself that isn't even real. So for me, like this felt like the best thing I could be doing for myself. And for one, like I've always been an entrepreneur and I like to code, you know, it it gets my creative juices going. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. All that being said, I I think it was the best thing I could have done for myself at the time. And so, so Sober Sidekick has been in existence for almost four years or four years right now? Almost four years. Almost four years. Okay. And then can you give us kind of a walkthrough of, of what this app does? Yeah. Why people should even care about it. Yeah. Yeah. So from a broader perspective, one of the things we believe, our, we, our team believes is that isolation is the single biggest social determinant of health in all behavioral health, but you can make the case throughout healthcare. And quality of life is dependent, in my opinion, largely on where on the spectrum of isolation and connectedness you feel. Yeah. And when you're in recovery, you know, you need connection like right now sometimes and it might be 2 a.m. And you know, so I was sitting in an AA meeting and I was watching the support flow back and forth and no one go without support and you know, I was thinking like how could we create an algorithm where no one ever goes without support? And that's the most important aspect of it. And you know, the other aspect of paying it forward and giving to receive, like what if paying it for was built into the experience of the platform? So, you know, 30 days later released a very, very basic MVP, but the goal was just to test that exchange of support. And in theory, no one should ever go without support, meaning there is no scenario where someone would write a post and not get support from one of their peers. A response. Yeah. Yeah. A written response from one of their peers. And just for people listening, MVP is a minimum viable product. It's in the digital space and in other spaces, even if you're starting a business, you might might want to create a minimum viable product to see if that business has legs. Mm -hmm. And in this case, Chris created an MVP with the app to see if it would have some stickiness and people would want to start using it. Yeah. So I just wanted to give people that. But go ahead, finish your thought. Yeah, yeah. And um, after like 10 rejections from Apple, it was finally approved 30 days after that. So, I'm glad you didn't give up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. 10 rejections. Okay. I've heard, I've heard others. I've, I have a friend that he, his app got rejected like 22 times before mm-hmm. they actually said, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and do this. Yeah. So he had to keep fixing it and 
You know, yeah. Apple's very picky about how they want things to look and be on their on their app store. Oh yeah. But the coolest part for me is like as soon as it's live, it's like texting my friends in recovery, like sober sidekick, check it out. It's live in the app store. But then looking at the analytics and seeing people that I didn't know yeah. and reaching out to them and being like, How did you find us? And like on day one, them saying, I found you through a search. So seeing how big the problem was from the perspective that people are finding this on like the fifth page of some search. Yeah. Because they're looking for a solution and isolation is their biggest problem. Right. You know, and seeing that like, and then seeing them all support each other from day one, Mm -hmm. that got my juices going. And, you know, that made me realize like this could be the start of something huge yeah. if I stick with it. Yeah. I mean, when you think of it, like, I, I mean, you know, my my dad, I, I haven't really told this story that much, but my father really struggled with alcohol, some drugs, not a lot, mm-hmm. but definitely alcohol. And, you know, I think I was, my joke is like, you know, he would have been, had he lived to this point in time when marijuana is legal, I think yeah. been, he would have been in this happy place. But <laughs> But the bottom line was he he definitely struggled with alcohol, but he mm. finally got free. And I, you know, I and I still have his AA coin. Mm. And I remember, I mean, it, those meetings were everything for him. I mm-hmm. mean, it really helped him. That camaraderie, the connectedness, as you said, was so important for him. Mm. And he never, you know, up until his deathbed, he, you know, he he never had another drink. And I was I was always proud, mm. you know, that he was able to fight that demon, if you will, mm. and overcome it. Yeah. And not let it control him. But he was fully aware that, you know, he was, you know, that he was susceptible to the whims mm-hmm. like we all are. Right. And, yeah. and one minute you can be at, at a high note and the next minute you could be in the gutter somewhere. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I always, you know, for me, I recognize the power mm-hmm. of those groups and especially um, Alcoholics Anonymous and oh, yeah. how it can do it. But it could be anything. I mean, it can be, you know, if you have a porn addiction, if you've got a substance abuse addiction. It doesn't really matter. I mean, mm-hmm. those groups can help you, right? Yeah. I mean, self-harm, eating disorders. Yeah, absolutely. Even, even just chronic depression. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, without a doubt. So mm-hmm. I think it's important. So you you have obviously, in some ways, captured lightning in a bottle because when you think of all of the AA organizations or meetings all over the world, mm-hmm. you know, there is a need for something like the Sober Sidekick. And then the pandemic happened. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> which caused just, people to be alone. And then it and just, isolated. It didn't make the problem worse, in my opinion. It just exposed the problem. Yeah. That was always always there. Yeah. So what version are you now of this app? Yeah, I mean, we're hundreds of iterations. Okay. Okay. In. I mean, how much I mean, where is the app now versus where it was when you started in day thirty? Yeah. I mean, it's been rebuilt from scratch three or four times. Okay. And, you know, it's just been optimized. Like one of the big things early on in the first year is my phone number was available to our users. Oh, okay. Okay. Which was also good for my own recovery because all day, every day I'm getting calls from people who are on day one or they're a few days ahead of me, but they're thinking about quitting that day. Yeah. Or like, you know, people would tell me things that they didn't tell, never told their wife or their kids. Like, you know, a guy told me, you know, 30 days ago, I had a gun to my head and I pulled the trigger and it misfired. Wow. And I feel like I'm on it a second chance at life. Yeah. You know, people would tell me that the SWAT team kicked in my door last night. And even people in my own world, like that I knew, from real life, but didn't know that they were, they were in recovery or yeah. struggling, yeah. were reaching out to me. Really? And so I was, I tried to put myself on the front lines as much as possible because when you're building an app, what you're really building is a psychological experience. Sure. And sure. you know how, like there's a saying, people will forget what you said, but they'll never forget how you made, made them, them feel. feel. Yeah. An app is the same way. So it, it's... You know, the core features are important, but how you present them and the empathy behind how you you present the design, you know, empathy driven design is so important. Sure. 
And, you know, in many ways, our first hundred, our first thousand members were like co-founders. Yeah. And they were on it every day and they dealt with the bugs and they welcomed every new member. And that like that was the coolest part is like every time, you know, a few new members trickled in a day, like all these people who have been around for 30 days, 60 days, just crowded that person with support. And our members were really our best feature, you know, because they are the reason why people keep coming back. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love, I love hearing that. And and so at the present time, as we're recording this, you have, would you call them 150,000 daily active users or would you just say you have 150,000? Total. Total. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's yeah. cool. So, and obviously you're able to kind of see through the metrics, how people are using the app, what yeah. they're doing. And, and certainly you're probably ideating different ways to make the ha- app mm-hmm. even better. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the coolest new features, which was actually somewhat simple to implement. A lot of times you think that, you know, the hardest features are the most valuable features. But a few months ago, we released a feature that we call impact score. Okay. Where our members can actually see the impact that they've had on the sobriety time of others in real time. And then they can also see the butterfly effect. So it's like you supported 12 people in the last week and they've been sober for a combined 522 days. Wow. And then they went out and supported 150 people who have been sober for 2,000 days. And one of the things that's so important for people in early recovery is to realize that their suffering and their shame can be transformed into purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, as soon as you realize that you are in a position to support people in a way no one else can because of your own personal experience, that's when you realize you're on a comeback story. Right. And the coolest thing for me is to see people, you know, today who may have joined 30 days ago, like, you know, there was this woman who called me a few months ago and she's like, she had only been on the app for like 30 days. And she's like, wanted to let you know, I I set up a support group for single moms in recovery through the app. And, you know, we have a top features or top user section of the app. And any given time, there's someone who may have given support, written support 50 times in one day or 150 times. Wow. There's someone on the platform who has given support over 10,000 times. Really? Which is like five to 10 times more than I have. And I've been the creator and on the app from (laughs) the beginning. And the key thing about this, Chris, which I, I don't think should be lost on the audience is that None of that would have been possible in a in the real world as opposed to being virtually in or mm-hmm. online where you mm-hmm. have an app and you're able to kind of multiply mm-hmm. that impact that you have with people and the mm-hmm. connectedness because of of what the internet represents and more importantly mm-hmm. because of what your app represents. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know the internet makes a lot of things possible, but I feel unfortunately we use the internet to amplify our worst qualities. Sure. And, you know, when it comes to big tech or mainstream tech, it's not about good engagement. It's just about engagement. Engagement, yeah. And, you know, we built our platform with a we thesis with empathy and without ego. Okay. Because when you optimize against ego and the user experience, people begin to realize that we're all the same. Right. And we all have fears and we all have insecurities and that we're stronger together. One of our teammates, Lindy Backus, uh, he was actually my economic development professor in college. Okay. But he's a part of our team now. And, you know, he likes to quote a proverb, which is, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, Far, go go together. together. Yeah, Yeah. that's one of my favorites. Yeah, that's a good one. So I love that. Well, I know people are are probably wondering how, how... And the heck did you end up in Northwest Arkansas? (laughs) Yeah. So I just read a book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And, you know, I was doing Sober Sidekick. I've been doing Sober Sidekick for like a year and a half, but I was, you know, working other jobs that weren't even tech that were barely paying my bills. And this job interview came up for this job that I thought was way out of my league. Yeah. And I almost didn't go to the job interview. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I thought, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway. So I went to the job interview and 
ended up getting the job and uh, Emma Willis was one of my interviewers and we worked together for the next six months and Emma Willis is an Arkansas native and yes. sh- she and her teammates were based in Arkansas. So that was my first exposure. Okay. With Venture Noir. No, not Venture Noir. Oh. It, was, it was a fintech company called oh. Suchi. Oh, Suchi. Okay, right, right. Yeah. Okay, got you, got you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I know I know Emma very well, and and Emma is yeah. an outstanding individual and a leader in in this Northwest Arkansas community that's trying to to diversify the opportunities that exist here in Northwest Arkansas and beyond. Yeah, she's a um, pillar. She is. She mm-hmm. is. That's a good word. That's a, that's what we're going to use. Emma Willis, the pillar. That's for <laughs> sure. So go ahead. I fit. You can finish your thought. Yeah. So work together built a really good relationship. And then we ended up quitting on the same day. And I told her like straight up, I'm going all in on Sober Sidekick now. And she went on to Venture Noir. Right. But immediately when she was at Venture Noir, she was like, you need to bring Sober Sidekick to Northwest Arkansas. And it's just like, I don't quite get it. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, when you're in this startup world, there's so many well-intentioned people who are overselling things yep. and don't know it. Yep. And, you know, so initially, like I, I didn't take it that seriously until she had just made connection after connection over Zoom. And then finally, um, you know, I, I made a trip out here to meet some of those people in person. Ramsey Ball was the main one who he's been sober for 15 years. And he was a big, as soon as he heard about what he was what we are doing, he became our biggest fan. Okay. And he wrote a couple checks okay. also. Okay. You know, and as our first angel investor. So made a trip out here and, you know, saw the intentionality and kind of got this vibe that this location in itself is a startup. Yeah. And, you know, one of the reasons why I will always be a part of my own startup or working for someone else's startup. Mm-hmm is when you are a part of a startup, you get to define things that weren't defined. And yeah, that's a good point. You know, so we realized like this location is on a path to grow and grow very fast. And, you know, there's intentionality about diversity. There's intentionality about community. There's intentionality about healthcare and closing gaps. And, you know, people are approachable. And, you know, coming from LA after COVID, all my meetings were over Zoom. No one wanted to drive anywhere or meet in person yeah. anywhere anyway. So it's yeah. like, I really missing in LA. I don't really party. I work all the time anyway. Sure. So sure. what am I missing in LA by being here? Right. Outside of my walks on the beach, which I do miss that. Yes. But yeah, yeah. So took a leap of faith and, um, I definitely would not have been able to take that leap of faith if my girlfriend wasn't on board from the beginning also. So yeah, here we are. And it, it no Fine. longer feels like a leap of faith. It feels like sound logic. Sound logic. I love that. It love, yeah. So what do you think of Northwest Arkansas? Just give me an encapsulate it for people listening. Because, you know, one of the things that we do with this podcast is we're always trying to encourage people to come here. Right. Mm-hmm. And and I always say I'm trying to encourage a diverse set of folks to mm-hmm. consider making Northwest Arkansas home. Yeah. This area is growing by leaps and bounds. I think it's mm-hmm. like 30 net new people a day arrive mm-hmm. here. So that's pretty cool. What would you say to somebody listening to this that has either heard about Northwest Arkansas, has a friend that lives here and is kind of on the edge about possibly moving here. Mm -hmm. What would your advice be coming from LA, which Mm -hmm. is important and, you know, coming here and finding the whole ecosystem, right? So just your life, Mm -hmm. but then also your work and everything else and how that plays into it. What would you say to somebody about Northwest Arkansas? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is don't knock it till you try it (laughs) is the first thing I would say. And then From there, I would say, you know, I've never been in a place where things move this quickly. Yeah. You know, and you aren't crowded by noise and, you know, the right person is there and approachable. Right. And, you know, a business, a startup or whatever it is that drives you, it all comes down to so much of it comes down to you know, the people who believe in what you're doing. Yeah. And one of the things I saw 
after attending the Heartland Summit and getting to know certain people very well, is there are strong values that are held here when it comes to community, Mm -hmm. when it comes to changing the status quo. Because, you know, if you look at Arkansas, where it's how it's ranked as a state in certain areas. (laughs) We have our challenges. (laughs) Yeah. But the people who recognize that are extremely intentional. Yes. That's a good point. And even with like certain groups. (laughs) Yeah. Like the people who want to make progress are, in my opinion, more intentional here than anywhere else. Yeah. And, you know, the unity and the community that has been created around it. I feel like no one's competing against each other and it's a focus on collaboration. That's my sentiment. Exactly. That's what I've been saying is that I don't know what it is. I mean, the playing field is fairly level here and you don't feel like you've got somebody like waiting to just stab you in the back so they can take Mm -hmm. over what you're trying to do. Everybody is is excited about what mm-hmm. everybody else is doing. Yeah. You know, like with my podcast, people are always like, oh man, I, I mm-hmm. think it's great because you are highlighting all the things that make this such a special place and you're mm-hmm. bringing in all these diverse voices to mm-hmm. share their story like you. Yeah. And I think that's important. And this is a place where it's not a competition as far as that's concerned. Mm-hmm. Yes, we have competition, but it's it's in a healthy way. Yeah. Right. And the other thing I would add to what you said in terms of this being a diverse ecosystem for those that want to do startups or mm-hmm. be involved with startups, it's also a good place to come if you mm-hmm. just want to have a job. Yeah. Right. There's, I mean, you know, you got the Fortune One in Walmart, you've got the mm-hmm. Fortune 50 or 500 in JB Hunt, and then Tyson. And mm-hmm. I mean, you know, th- there are all kinds of opportunities mm-hmm. for people here in Northwest Arkansas. Yeah. And even, even just moving here, this area is going to be, Let's say if we were to put this in startup terms, maybe five years ago was pre seed, um, <laughs> two years ago was seed. Now they're at Series A. Right. If you get here and even just build a network and, you know, maybe own a little real estate, mm-hmm. build some connections, some social capital, yep. all that stock is going to go up. 500% Absolutely. over the next five years. Yeah, because to me, it's all about relationships. And mm. if there was ever a place where I, I would say that you could really develop like mature, meaningful relationships, mm. it would be Northwest Arkansas. And mm. I've said that over and over again. And a lot of people don't believe me mm-hmm. until they come here. And then they're like, oh, I had no idea. I thought people would just be mm. trying to steal my ideas or mm-hmm. maybe just kind of give me surface level attention, but mm-hmm. not really connect. I've connect, Everybody that I've been introduced to has connected with me. And, I'm, and it's I'm, not just a Zoom, it's let's no, grab breakfast. No, breakfast, coffee. Yeah. I mean, even when I reached out to you, you were like, you know, at, at first I was like, man, this brother just got an award and he's getting some more funding and he's doing big things. You know, sometimes people are like, I don't really have time for all that. And I mm-hmm. reached out to you and you were like, sure, let's do it. And Honestly, I would say 99.9% of the time, that is the response that I get from people when I mm-hmm. reach out to them and say, hey, I'd mm-hmm. love to share my platform with you and tell mm-hmm. your story. That's it. I don't yeah. want anything. I don't, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not looking for vested funds or anything mm-hmm. like stock yeah. or whatever. I'm yeah. just saying, hey, I just want to share the platform because I know that it, in me sharing these stories with individuals out here, both here in Northwest Arkansas, as well mm-hmm. as those that are on the fence about moving here. I can create a great case for why this is a growing part of the country. We're mm-hmm. in the Heartland, like you said, the Heartland mm-hmm. Summit. But you know, I was a part of the Heartland Forward Builders and Backers Program, mm-hmm. and there is just so much happening here. Mm-hmm. And I don't want it to be the best kept secret, right? I mean, yeah. I want people, more people, to know about it because this area is going to grow. We're going to see up to about a million people in the population here by 2040, 2045 at the latest. Mm. And that's, you know, that's. That train is moving, whether we like it or not. Yeah. You just have to, you have to get on it. You oh have yeah. To get on it. hundred so, percent. Yeah. So I'm glad you're here. And I certainly want to connect anyone that's listening to this, to the work that you're doing and mm-hmm. specifically to Sober Sidekick, but what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a contact form on the website. You give the website address? Yeah. Sobersidekick.com. Sure. So that will go to my email directly. Also, download the app. Right. And I'm involved in the community. 
And, and it's on Android and uh, Apple? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You'll find it there. Rank 4.8 out of five. <laughs> <laughs> and if you try it out and you use it, give them a review and let them know. You know, we're always asking for reviews on this podcast, but you know, when you try out an app that kind of changes your life or mm -hmm. really impacts you, or you, you find yourself sharing that app with other people, take a few minutes out to give a review for that app because it helps the developer. Oh, yeah. It helps the person that created it. And it's just social proof that this is legitimate. This is a worth your time. And more than that, more than it helping the developer, it helps the next person who's isolated and it's 3 a.m. And, yeah. they're like, and they're maybe six months sober and they're like, huh, maybe I can't do it. And then they scroll through the app store and they see your review right. about how you connected with people and how you got out of isolation. Like there's a few reviews I've seen like this, but I've seen reviews and these are the ones that get to me where people say, I was in tears within my first five minutes on yeah. the platform. And these are strangers that I've never met and right. <laughs> never will meet. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of human emotional experience, you know, we just got to bring people together. So much of life is my projection of you yeah. engaging with your projection or my projection of me engaging with your projection of you. Right. And we're just trying to bring those projections down and connect human to human, connect right you know, as we are, yeah. you know, come as you are. That's yeah. the biggest thing. Exactly. I mean, you, you've said it perfectly and that's kind of what it's all about. And that's actually why I love the platform of podcasting, because it just allows us to kind of get kneecap to kneecap and have mm -hmm. a conversation and have yeah. real talk, right? Not mm -hmm. a lot of fluff, not a lot of hyperbole, but just reality, mm -hmm. right? Because your reality, and I know that somebody is going to listen to this and be like, man, you know, Chris is me. I'm going through the same thing. And, mm -hmm. and man, now that I know that this guy could overcome it, I can overcome it. Right. Yeah, if you I know? can, if I can overcome it, anyone, can. <laughs> anyone can. So, yeah. man, this has been great. I, I really appreciate you, Chris, taking time out of your schedule, your programming schedule, uh, the running of this app schedule. It's the Sober Sidekick. You guys need to check it out. You can also check out the website at SoberSidekick.com. Leave Chris a message. Just Drop him a note and say you heard about it first here at the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast. And we'll be sure to put all of his contact information and even a picture of him. So you see, you know, the genius behind this great app. You can see it all for yourself. We'll put all of that on the show notes at I Am Northwest Arkansas dot com. But Chris Thompson, thank you so much for coming out and joining us for this episode of the podcast. I believe that your words of encouragement, your testimony, if you will will be freeing for somebody listening to this and will cause them to say, you know what? I need to get that app. I've been sober, but I need some help. And I think this app can help me bridge the gap of connectivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's what it's all about. You know? Yeah. We're all here to just pay it forward. Absolutely. Well, there you go. Chris Thompson, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much, Randy. Absolutely. Well, folks, there you have it. Another episode of the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast. To learn more about this podcast, you can visit our website at IamNorthwestArkansas.com. Remember, you can find our podcast wherever great podcasts can be found. And if you do listen to us on Apple Podcasts, we would love a review. If you don't want to give us five stars, give us four or four and a half. And if you don't like the podcast, just tell us why you don't like it and we'll work on it. I mean, I, this is not, you know, we, we are not in a, in a uh, vacuum here. We, we're looking for feedback and we consistently want to get better at, at everything that we do. So definitely check us out on every major podcasting platform. And remember, our newsletter comes out fairly frequently, but please, you can subscribe to our newsletter on our website at IamNorthwestArkansas.com. I'm the host, Randy Wilburn. And remember, our podcast comes out every Monday, rain or shine. We will see you next week. Peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. Check us out each and every week, available anywhere that great podcasts can be found. For show notes or more information on becoming a guest, visit IamNorthwestArkansas.com. We'll see you next week on I Am Northwest Arkansas.